All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Monday. I hope you had a good weekend. Good weekend? Fun? I think I asked some of you this, and it seemed like it was Ryan, Regina. Did you guys have fun? Kind of. Kind of? Yeah. yeah. OK. Not bad? All right. All right, I'll take that. I'll take that over, over like, <laughs> um, let's, let's figure out where we, where we are here. Ah, uh, yes. So, on Friday, the day when most of you weren't here, I know you thought I wouldn't notice, but I did. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, we watched the rest of that documentary on the Roaring Twenties, right? And again, the documentary was really based on the United States, right? It was based on some of the events that were happening in the Twenties. Some of the things that were happening in the US were happening in other places, uh, but maybe not to the same extent, right? So we did see lots of social and cultural change. We did see lots of technological change. We did see lots of industrial growth, but it kind of didn't happen, you know, in quite an extreme fashion as it did in the United States, right? Because the United States was kind of spared the destruction of World War I, right? They, they came out of it relatively unscathed, and so their economy was flying high, they were manufacturing lots of things, lots of people were getting rich, people's standard of living was increasing. It was a wild and crazy time, right? And we saw we kind of saw some of that happening, right? Um, let me see, yeah. So, do you, do you remember, or hopefully you paid attention, some social or cultural changes that were happening in the United States in the 20s? What was kind of happening socially or culturally? Or do you want to start with technology? The what? The yeah, the the manufacture of the car. Yeah. And and cars changed everything, right? They changed everything about what people were able to do on the weekend, right? They could go out of town. It changed the way that cities were designed and built, right? If you have cars, you've got to have roads that are wide enough for them and you've got to have parking lots and parking and traffic lights and lines on the street and traffic laws and licensing and there's all kinds of things that go along with that that didn't exist before right and so the arrival of the car is really yeah a really important thing in designing cities right what else did we see cultural technological anything Any changes we saw in the 20s? The American Paris movement? Yeah, right? So we saw lots of people building high-rise buildings, right? And building them really tall, right? The Chrysler Building was the tallest building in the world, right? At 1,000 feet, huge, right? Empire State surpasses it a couple years later, right? Big, ambitious construction, right? And again, for the day, incredible right that something something is that tall right um, yeah and those guys that were working on the on those skyscrapers at the top holy cow those guys are insane right they don't have harnesses on they're just climbing up the beams and they're throwing red hot rivets at each other and oh I would like to say I hope they were paid well but I kind of have the Kind of have the impression that they weren't. Um, what else did we see? What's that? Roads get bigger. Yeah. 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 Right. So, yeah, cities have to be kind of redesigned or reorganized, right? Roads have to be paved, right? Before, before roads weren't really paved, because why, right? But cars needed them 
paved and so now you've got to pave roads and sidewalks and paint lines on the street and traffic lights right and traffic laws and all this kind of stuff right and so the car changes all kinds of things about um, uh, about how cities work right and again lots of people lots of people are getting run over by them in their in their early days right because people people don't have driver's licenses right they just buy a car and drive it right that's it nobody knows the traffic laws the traffic laws aren't that good kids are not used to them people are not used to them and so yeah lots of people are getting run over early in the history of the car because they're just not really used to this technology right um, what about radio as a technology what's the importance what's the significance of that something to uh, yeah right definitely a source of entertainment right there's lots of radio shows there's music that you can hear uh, it does bring people together right people can kind of have the same experience right they can listen to the same things at exactly the same time right incredible you could sit around and listen to well what were people listening to radio shows and music but what else Uh, yeah, hold on to the washing machine though. What were people listening to on the radio? Yeah, right? Baseball game. Well, we saw baseball games and boxing matches, right? And again, the only way to really keep track of what your team was doing before that was to just read, um, if, you, if you couldn't afford to go to the game, is just read the paper the next day, which, does that sound really exciting to you? Not really, right? It's not nearly the same thing as watching the game, but here people can listen to it, right? They've got commentators telling you what's happening. And of course we still have that, don't we? Yeah, if you watch sports, there's still people, it's kind of funny, right? Because you've got people telling you what's happening even though you're like watching the game and you can see it for yourself, right? But you've still got someone telling you what you're seeing, which again is a little strange, but I think it comes from radio, right? There was such a strong history of commentators, right? People talking about the game and telling you what's happening that even when people started seeing it on TV those guys still were there telling you what was happening and even yeah right up to today we still see that right we have commentators for sports events right um, but yeah hugely exciting right to be able to listen to the game listen to the fight while it was actually happening right you would know immediately what the outcome was and you could kind of follow along with it right it's not as good as watching it, but in 1925, it's, that's the next best thing, right? Um, yeah, a huge source of information as well, right? Especially if you couldn't read, which, again, literacy was pretty high in the 1920s, but it wasn't 100%. Some people couldn't read, right? And so you could get the news by listening to the radio. Right? Before, you couldn't read a newspaper, People just had to tell you, I guess, what was going on. Oh, wow, yeah, we've got radio, we've got cars, we've got electricity. What else did we have, David? Yeah, vacuum cleaners and washing machines, all the modern conveniences for housewives, because of course, husbands weren't doing any housework. That was, you know, that was women's work at the time, right? Um, but yeah, all these kind of miracles of technology to help make the home more efficient or more comfortable. Oh, and refrigerators too, right? We should probably say refrigerators because those run on electricity. My dad, believe it or not, my dad apparently, he can remember a time when he was growing up, he was quite young, where a guy with a horse cart would actually deliver blocks of ice to people's refrigerators. Because before you had a plug-in refrigerator, you had a, a refrigerator that looks like ours, and then you'd put a big block of ice in the top of it. And that's what kept your food cold. Have you ever heard people call a refrigerator an ice box? Yeah, that's why, because originally 
it was a box that you put a big block of ice in, and that's what kept your food cold. And so every few days, a guy had to come around and deliver a big block of ice for you to put into your ice box to continue to keep your food cold. And apparently, he can remember he can remember a time where a guy with a horse cart would come up the street and grab a big block of ice and deliver it to people's refrigerators, which is insane. I think he probably saw like the very last, the very last people to get ice deliveries for that reason. He was probably, I'm sure he was probably like five or six years old, but yeah, so plug in refrigerators, right? How convenient. Keeps your food nice and fresh and cold. Um, cultural changes. What were people doing socially and culturally? Besides driving around and listening to the radio? Not at the same time, though, because cars didn't have radios. That's crazy. Yeah? Yeah, lots of, lots of um, I guess a lot more freedom for women, right? Women were working jobs during the First World War, and they kind of take that freedom and kind of keep it rolling into the 1920s, right? And so you see short skirts, short hair, women out dancing and drinking. <gasps> scandalous, right? Or at least would have been scandalous before. It was probably still scandalous to the old, the old people at the time. But young people were kind of expressing themselves, right? Out dancing, out drinking, out having a good time, listening to jazz music, right? Which was the popular music of the day. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of things going on. And then we got to the stock market crash at the end, right? And kind of the beginning of the Great Depression. And what, what, was the, what happened when the stock market crashed? Well, what does that even mean? So it's a bit of a, that was really good, Regina. It's a bit of a cycle, right? As, so people, people are producing all of these <coughs> wonders of technology, right? But again, there's kind of a, you reach kind of a market saturation, right? There's really a limit to how much people can buy. People really, people only need one vacuum cleaner, right? Again, maybe some of us have two in our house nowadays. That's a little more normal. But at the time, you had one vacuum cleaner, right? if you were lucky. You had one car if you were lucky. Does anyone have a house in which there are two washing machines? Probably not, right? Once people have bought one, that's it, right? And so you can't just keep producing this stuff forever and ever because eventually, you know, people will, sales are gonna level out, right? People don't need to buy another one. And when that starts happening, People, factories start to gear down their manufacturing. They start to lay people off. Those people don't have money to spend on these things. Fewer things are sold. And then things start to slide down, right? And, but we also said that people were investing in the stock market with borrowed money, right? This is what they called buying on margin, right? 
So you borrow money from the bank, you, in, you buy a bunch of stocks, your stocks increase in value, you sell them, you pay the bank off, and you keep the profit, right? It's like free money, right? It's free money, but again, that only works if the market continues to go up. When it starts to come down and people need their money back, it becomes a bit of a panic, right? Because you don't want the value of your stocks to go below what you owe the bank, right? Because you borrowed $10,000 from the bank that you can't pay back. Right? You don't have $10,000 to lose. And so people try to sell their stocks so that they can just have enough to pay the bank back and they're not in debt. But of course, if everyone does that at the same time, everyone is selling and no one's buying. And if nobody's buying, the price continues to drop. And eventually, it hits the bottom, right? Everyone is trying to sell their stocks. Nobody is buying stocks. and it's a disaster, right? It's a complete disaster. People lose, you know, people are in debt to the bank for thousands of dollars that they don't have, right? Money that people thought they had, even though it was kind of imaginary, money people thought they had is now gone, right? People's savings are gone too, right? Because there's a lot of small private banks at the time and they take your money into a savings account and then they invest it, right? But if people call in those loans, there's no money in the bank, right? And people go to the bank in a panic to try to withdraw their money so that they don't lose it, and the bank's doors are closed. They're like, sorry, we have no money. Your money is gone, right? And so it's kind of this, it's kind of a house of cards, right? Everything is kind of built on imaginary money or future value, right? And that's fine as long as things continue to go up. But if things start to go down, people try to sell things off to get their money back. And if everyone does it at the same time, you have a disaster, right? And that's exactly what happens. The market kind of goes crazy and it's unregulated and it's just shooting for the moon and then once it takes a downturn, nobody can really, nobody can really ride it out, right? They, they need their money back, but the money that they need back doesn't exist because it's gonna be paid back in 10 more years, right? All of that credit that we talked about. And so the money that they need, it doesn't exist. It's not there, right? And so everything kind of collapses. Again, people, people are ruined, right? They're bankrupted, they lose their savings. There's people jumping out windows because they've lost everything. It's pretty bleak, right? Um, and it kind of, it, it's kind of the start of the Great Depression, but it doesn't cause the Great Depression, okay? That's a, a bit of a misconception. And so the stock market crash doesn't create a depression, but it's a handy place to, for historians to say that it started, right? It's a specific date, right? But it doesn't really cause the Great Depression, but again, it does transition into it, right? And so really for the next 10 years, the, um, the United States and other countries around the world are going to have economies that are just kind of limping along, right? Imp unemployment will be super high. Um, and we may, we may get to that a little bit later. Um, what do you think the unemployment rate in Canada is? The percentage of people who do not have a job what do you think the percentage is? Don't have a job, but want one. Okay, so, so maybe 10%? Yeah. Okay, what do you think? Unemployment rate in Canada? People who don't have jobs, but might want them? How many people are unemployed? Maybe more than 20%. 20? Okay. What do you think? David, what do you think? Give me a number. 40? Yeah. Holy cow. Okay. Uh, ben says 70 or 80. Uh, ho hopefully you're talking, hopefully Ben, you're talking about um, employed. Um, so again, this is, this is the, the unemployment rate, right? So the people who are capable of having jobs and want jobs but can't find them, okay? 
And so usually it's around 5% in Canada, okay? So sometimes it tracks up a little bit. Sometimes it'll get to maybe seven. Sometimes it drops and it comes down to about four or so. But Canada kind of oscillates between, probably between about four and eight tops. If it ever got to like 12 or 20%, total panic. Right? I think during the Great Depression it was closer to 30%. And so, but that is like catastrophic, right? A third of people cannot find work. That's a disaster, right? It, at least in Canada and the United States, that's a disaster, right? So, again, you can imagine if Canada is running around 5 to 8% unemployment, during the Great Depression, if you're at 30%, man, it's. It's a disaster, right? It's ugly. And so it does get ugly for it does get ugly for the United States for about a decade. David, you're giving me a look. Well, I can't interpret your look. You you what? I guess what what's forty percent? It, it's re that's really high. That's really high. And so, yeah, in, in terms of like what's, you know, for, for an economy like Canada's, what's kind of normal and okay, five to eight percent is where politicians are like, okay, we're, yeah, we're a little up, we're a little down, that's where we should be, right? But it, yeah, if we go to, if we go anywhere near like 12 even, holy cow, are we in trouble, right? Big trouble. Never mind, never mind half of people without jobs. That's just like catastrophe, right? That's the end of days for Canada. Um, but again, it does get really, it'll get really bad for the United States and really bad for other places as well, right? Because again, there's going to be, you know, for the United States, there's a big jump, right? In terms of economy and everything is flying high and it's a big party and then psh, everything comes crashing down and it's going to be a rough 10 years and it's going to be a rough 10 years for other countries too but they kind of didn't have that peak right so even though other countries are going to suffer through a depression it's kind of it's not going to seem quite as bad right because they things weren't going great and now oh they're going worse right for the US it was like Wow, we're living the dream. And then, yeah, and then it's disaster, right? So it's a little more, it's further to fall for the United States, a little, maybe a little more disappointing for them, but other places are gonna go through a depression as well, but we'll get to that. Now, you've told me, or at least we've seen that the 1920s is a period of rapid change, right? Technology, electricity, radio, cars, planes, um, and cultural changes, right? In terms of the sort of, not the emancipation of women, but women getting more freedom and more power. Um, but it's also a period of political change as well, okay? So there's social, there's economic, there's cultural, but there's also political, okay? So as the world is kind of coming out of the 1900s, it's a, it's a period in which people are rethinking how their country is run, okay? So when we start out, let's say in, the, in 1900, there's basically two political systems, okay? There's democracy, which exists, right? The US is a democracy, France is a democracy, um, Britain has some democratic elements to it, right? And then there's monarchies. Right? Countries that have a king, right? or an emperor, or a kaiser, or something like that. Right? So most countries are either, they have a king of some sort, or a queen. They're a democracy, or they're kind of a blend of the two. Right? Britain's kind of a blend of the two. Right? It still has a queen, it had a king at the time, but there's also a house of lords. Right? There's, a, there's a democracy thing happening. But at the end of World War II, we have the birth of two brand new political systems, 
right? So there's all this technology and cultural change, but there's also political change in the creation of two new political systems, okay? Um, and they're important, right? Especially for, for this period of history, but maybe also for, maybe also for the period of history that we're in. Um, but we'll, we'll deal with these one at a time, okay? So to describe this, this is a useful graphic here, okay? Because not only does it talk about fascism and communism and democracy, but it's also useful for talking about democracies themselves and how they work. Okay. So, have you heard people talk about this before? People who are right wing and left wing, people who are on the right, people who are on the left, the radical right, the radical left, the alt right, the alt left. Have you heard people say things like that, kind of? A few of them, anyway. Did you know what they were talking about when people were on the right or the left? Did you know or not really? Okay, okay. It's all right if you didn't know because after today you will know. Um, so right and left wing, this is kind of a, this is a spectrum that they use in politics. Maybe it's a political science thing, I'm not sure. And it talks about how people, what flavor do people like their government? How do they like their government to be, okay? So, and we can think about how people like their government to be in terms of how involved the government is in the economy and people's economic lives, and how involved the government is in people's social lives, okay? So, the other way you can think about this is in terms of parents, okay? What kind of a parent do you want? What do you want them to be involved in in your life? Or do you kind of want them to be less involved? Let me show you. Okay, let's talk about government involvement in people's economic lives, okay? So if you are someone who is out on the right wing, and again, you don't have to be all the way out. You don't have to be a fascist for this. Just a little bit, just a little bit on the right wing. In terms of economy, People who are on the right generally want government to stay out of people's hair, okay? So usually they want low taxes, or as low as they can go. They want not a lot of social programs. They don't want a bunch of regulations in the market. They kind of want the government to keep their hands off things, right? Yes, the government has to do a few things in the economy, right? They have to, you know, set monetary policy and tariffs for incoming goods and stuff like that but they really want the government to stay out of it let the market do what it's going to do right supply and demand and let businesses run freely let the labor market operate freely that's kind of what people on the right wing want they don't want the government to be heavily involved and they don't really want high taxes either they want to keep those taxes low and so as a result they tend to be less in favor of social programs, okay? Programs that kind of hand out money to people in need, right? Pensions, you know, student bursaries, disability pensions, um, you know, cheap daycare or free daycare. People on the right are kind of not into that, right? People on the right think, let's keep the taxes low and then people can take care of themselves, right? You wanna go to school, pay for it. Right? You need daycare, pay for it. Right? Government shouldn't be providing these things to people. Cool? Okay. If you go out on the left, you'll see kind of the opposite thing. Right? So people on the left are in favor of the government being involved. Right? They want government regulation in the market. They want social programs. Right? They want pensions for old people. They want disability money if people can't work. Um, if you have a baby, they want maternity or parental leave, right, for months and months, right, so you can stay home and take care of your baby. They want f subsidized or free health care, right? If you get sick and you go to the hospital, they don't want you to have a big bill when you leave, right? And so people on the right are, or people on the left, sorry, are more interested in that kind of thing, right? So 
The taxes tend to be higher because you have to pay for social programs, but you get a lot of social programs because of it, right? And so here in Canada, you'll know that our healthcare system is basically free, right? So if I need a heart transplant tomorrow, I can go to the hospital. Well, who knows because of COVID, but in normal times, I could go to the hospital, they would operate on my heart, and I wouldn't have to pay anything. Right? And again, I don't pay anything because it's coming out of our taxes. Our taxes are higher, but we get benefits from that. And people on the left are, are okay with that. Right? They want the government to take better care of people, and they're okay paying more taxes for it. The other part is people's involvement in, the pe in people's social lives. Okay? This one might be a little trickier. If you're on the right, you're someone who is often very traditional. right? You might have a strong sense of nationalism. You might have a strong sense of your culture. Uh, you might want to keep things kind of the way they are, or you might think back to the glory days of your country. Um, Yeah, you're, you're very interested in tradition kind of thing and, and, and the nation and the culture, okay? And, and maintaining it the way you think it is. People on the left are less interested in this, okay? They don't so much care about who people are. And so as a result, they're more accepting of diversity, right? So things like immigration, um, gay marriage, people from different cultures, from different religions, um, all of that stuff, people on the left are a little more open about those kind of things. Okay, those kind of things, okay? Um, sometimes people on the left are more in favor of abortion, but abortion is kind of a, that issue kind of cuts a little differently than some of the other ones do. But people over here on the left are kind of more accepting of diversity because they're not really too interested in who people are, right? They're open to everybody, they're, yeah, they're more accepting of diversity and change, immigration, all that stuff, okay? So this is kind of a way that you can think about politics. And, and I think this works in just about any country, I think, or in, in most countries. Um, mostly what you find is that democratic countries are pretty close to the center, okay? And so here in Canada, I would say that on average, we're pretty close to the center. Good morning we probably lean a little bit to the left, okay? So Canada's, you know, accepting of immigration, right? We've got high immigration targets. We've got a multiculturalism policy. We have a charter of rights and freedoms that tries to protect people who are um, of different uh, nationalities and races and ethnicities and genders and all that stuff, right? We're, we're kind of okay with that sort of thing. And so Canada's, pretty in the center, but we lean a little bit left. Right? Um, the United States is a little different. I think the United States has always leaned a little bit to the right, although nowadays it seems to be polarizing, right? It seems to be separating out, and so the Democrats seem to be leaning further left, right? Some of them all the way to socialism. Do you know who Bernie Sanders is? There was a meme about him last year with his mittens. Anyway, Bernie Sanders is a member of the Democratic Party. He's almost leaning towards socialism, right? But there's elements of the Republican Party that's leaning way over to the right, and they're almost flirting with fascist ideas, believe it or not. And so the US traditionally has been in the center, but I've, I feel like they've always leaned a little right. Canada's leaned a little left. But now it seems like the two sides are polarizing, they're splitting, and they're each leaning further out than they normally would. The Democrats are leaning way far to the left. The Republicans in particular are leaning way far to the right. And it's getting a little, it's getting a little hairy down there, right? It's getting a little unsettling. So this is kind of how we can think about um, governments and political systems, right? And, and if I asked you, I won't ask you, but could you put yourself somewhere on that spectrum in terms of how you feel about things, how you feel about your government? 
yeah, you could probably place yourself, right? And, you know, if you were here in Canada, you would probably find that the Liberal Party, Justin Trudeau's party, he's kind of, they're pretty close to the center, right? They lean, the Liberals lean to the left in terms of the social stuff. The Liberals lean to the right in terms of the economic stuff, so they're kind of right in the center. Our Conservative Party leans a little bit to the right. Our NDP party leans a little to the left, right? So we've got some selections here. And again, in the states, you've got Republicans who are increasingly leaning over this way, which is very frightening. Then you've got the Democrats that are kind of increasingly leaning this way, okay? So yeah, this kind of helps describe what kind of government people would like, right? And, and again, you can think of it like parents too, right? Do you want a parent who's really involved in your life and you know helping you out all the time and checking in with you and you know or do you want a parent who's kind of like leaves you alone a little more and lets you do your own thing right so people on the right want government to stay out of their stuff usually people on the left are okay with that extra extra involvement right? Maybe. so as you can see two of the kind of new political systems to come out of this period are actually on the extreme ends of this of this spectrum, right? Communism is way out on the left and fascism is way out on the right, right? And I'll talk about these in a second, but they they are out on these extreme ends and and sometimes we get them confused because both of them tend to have authoritarian governments or dictatorships. But politically, they are different, right? Because with communism, the government is totally involved in people's lives, right? Every aspect of the economy is controlled by the Communist Party and the state. Everyone works for the state, right? There's no private businesses. So if you go all the way up to communism, you'll find that the government is totally involved in people's lives because that's all there is. The government is the economy, right? They're everything. If you go out onto the far end of the right in terms of fascists, fascists are a little bit involved in people's economic lives, but there's also there's also or there's often a big focus on the nation, right? Who the people are, right? And again, most of us probably know a little bit about Hitler, and he was very involved in purifying the German race, right? The Aryan race. And that's that's an extreme involvement in people's social lives, right? He cared so much about who the people were that he focused exclusively on pure blood Germans, tried to exterminate it or kick out everybody else, and then he tried to like purify the Germans even more as a race, right? So Hitler had a really strong focus on the nation itself, right? That was, you know, to the point where it was like insane. Whereas again, communism is the other way. It's a total kind of involvement of in the economic lives of people, right? The state is the economy, right? And everyone works for them. So yeah, we have kind of, a, a, I guess a couple of political systems that are based in extremes, right? Now, democracy kind of lives at the, I'll go back for a second here. Whoops, nope, nope, there. Democracy kind of lives in the center, right? And so where there's kind of room to negotiate people's different views, right? As you go further out on the ends of the ends of the spectrum, there's less room for difference of opinion, right? There's less room for doing things differently, right? And so as you go out to the ends of the spectrum, you know, what's the way we do things becomes very kind of narrow and rigid, right? And often that's why you need an authoritarian or a dictator, right? You need to make people do things the correct way, right? Whereas in the center, it's more loose, right? People have different opinions, they argue about things, they vote, and then they complain about it when it doesn't go their way. Sometimes it becomes, you know, sometimes it's a little chaotic and there's lots of bad feelings, but as you go out, what's kind of right or wrong or good or bad becomes very, very narrow, okay? Um, 
Yeah, so democracy lives in the center, and as probably most of us know, um, the, democracy is that the power is with the people, right? So demos is a Greek word for people, kratos is a Greek word for rule or ruler, right? So democracy is rule by the people. And again, you can do this directly. In ancient Greece, they did, right? Everybody voted on everything. In most modern states, we have representative democracy, right? We elect people, and those people go and vote for us, right? Because we're all very busy living our lives. Um, yeah, so democracy has power held by the people themselves. Um, another important part of democracy, which Donald Trump and the Republican Party doesn't seem to want to admit, but it's true, unfortunately, well, unfortunately for them, um, the rule of law applies to all citizens, right? So you've probably heard this before, but it's very true in democracy. Nobody is above the law, right? The law is the most important thing, and it's most important that we all follow it, and it doesn't matter who we are. And again, that's a bit of an ideal. I know that you know laws don't apply to everyone equally all the time, even when they should, but in theory they do, right? So if I am accused of murdering someone and Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, is accused of murdering someone, in theory we should receive the same trial, right? We broke the same law and maybe we should receive the same punishment. Of course, he will have a much better lawyer than me and blah, 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 blah. But in theory, the rule of law is at the top, right? And nobody is above it. Democracies, of course, are usually paired with capitalism, right? An, eco an economic system where businesses are mostly held by private people, right? Not by the government. They're not publicly held, they're privately held. So again, here in, um, here in Canada, most businesses that you will interact with are owned by regular people, right? There's a few that are owned by the government, right? Canada Post. Canada Post is owned and run by the government, right? Canada Post, Canada Post owned by the government. Yep, that's why it loses a lot of money. But <laughs> no, that's not, that's not true. Um, Air Canada used to be a government corporation. Not so much anymore, but used to be run by the government. Via Rail, you can see them out the window there on the back of the train station. Via Rail used to be a government corporation as well. Not so much anymore. Um, but again, most, of, most companies are run and owned by just regular people, okay? Um, yeah, and after World War I, it's really the democracies that win, right? So um, Britain, France, um, the US, they're all democracies. And so when Europe's map is redrawn, like we saw it get redrawn, those new countries are all going to get democratic governments, right? Because that's who, that's who won, right? God creates people in his image, right? And so these democratic nations also create new nations in their image, right? And so all those new countries get democratic governments. Now, communism is the second one, but I think let's take a little break and then we'll talk about communism. I feel like my voice needs a break for a second. I don't know why, but I'm going to take a break. Okay, come back in 10. We'll deal with communism.
Ready, ready? All right. So we said that this period of history gives birth to two new political systems. One of them here is communism. And we'll come back to the communists a little bit later. Uh, as you probably know, uh, Russia becomes a communist country and is the Soviet Union for most of the 20th century. Um, communism, I don't know if you know, it comes out of the writings of this guy, these two guys here, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, mostly Marx. Um, and Marx's idea here is that he, well, his, hmm, how do I say it? His idea of communism comes out of this period as well, because Marx is alive. Do I have a, no, I don't have a picture of him. Marx is alive at a time when countries are industrializing. Okay, so factories are going up, people are flocking in from the countrysides and they're getting jobs in factories and these factories are churning out all kinds of, pro of uh, products. But it's kind of a, an environment that's not really fair for the worker. Okay, so there's lots of factory workers, there are no labor laws, so these factory workers are working long hours for basically as little money as, po as they can possibly be paid. Um, they're working dangerous jobs, dirty jobs, long hours for very little pay. And of course, and of course, that's okay. And of course in those factories, when those factories make, I don't know, a million dollars at the end of the year, who makes that money? Who gets to keep that profit? Mm, in, a, in a communist system, maybe, but in a capitalist system, the owners, right? If I have my travel mug factory and all of you work in it, and we work for a year, and I pay you minimum wage, we work for a year, and guess what, guys? We sold thousands and thousands of these, and the company made a million dollars this year. Whose million dollars is that? Mine, right? You guys don't get any of it. Is that fair? Well, capitalism says it is fair, right? Because I'm the owner, and I get the profits. But Marx kind of saw that, and he's like, well, actually, that's not fair, right? Because that million dollars is the profit of your labor, right? Not the profit of my labor, right? I worked a little bit. Right? I sat behind the desk and looked at you know, spreadsheets and scratched my head a lot. But you guys are the ones who did the work. You guys are the ones who produced all these travel mugs. Right? And now the benefit from your labor, the profit, it all goes to me. Maybe I'll give you all a little bonus. How nice. right? But really, it goes to me. And Marx thought that that was exploitive. Right? That was exploiting the worker. Right, The benefits of their labor was going to the owner who wasn't doing the work. And so Marx suggested that really what we needed was a socialist system, right? a system where people like me didn't own factories. Right, People like me didn't own the means of production. It was actually the people, you guys. Right? And so what Marx imagined would happen is that eventually people would figure this out, right? The factory workers, the farm workers, eventually they would figure out that they were being exploited. They would figure out that the system wasn't fair. And what they would do is they would have a socialist revolution, right? So you guys would rise up, you would overthrow me, you'd throw me out in the street, you would take control of the factory, and then you guys would share equally in the profits of your labor, right? That million dollars would be divided amongst you, you know, as, as the workers, right? The people who did the actual labor, right? That was his idea. And so he wrote about it in a few, um, in a few places. He had um, a very, uh, he had two very popular books, Das Kapital and The Communist Manifesto. In it, he kind of described this process, right? He described that he felt capitalism was an exploitive system and the proletariat, you guys out there, needed to overthrow the bourgeoisie, me, right, in order to take control of the means of production. 
And so he wrote about these things. He wrote these two books. Um, he was partnered with that other guy, Frederick Engels, who interestingly was a factory owner, strangely enough. Um, but at the time, Marx's ideas weren't very popular. So he was writing in kind of the late 1800s, and really nobody paid too much attention to him. He was not very popular. He was kind of like sleeping on other people's couches because he didn't have a lot of money. And at the time of his death, nobody really cared about his writings at all. But people did start to read these things after his death. And of course, one of them was Vladimir Lenin, who would lead Russia into a kind of communist revolution himself. Um, yeah, and so Marx kind of defined this system of, of capitalism as a perpetual struggle, right? So me, the bourgeoisie, I'm constantly in a struggle with you, the proletariat, right? You guys want to do as little work as possible for as much money as possible, and I want to pay you as little as possible and get you to do as much as I can, right? We're constantly in this kind of tug of war, right? And of course we need each other, right? Because I can't, I can't make these without you, right? I need you to work in my factory, but you also need to work in my factory because you need a paycheck to feed your families, right? Kind of need each other and we're kind of locked in struggle. And of course, you know, in a modern economy, the government steps in and creates a bunch of rules and laws to make that a more equal struggle, right? At the time here that Marx is around, it's not really an equal struggle because there are no labor laws, right? So factory owners do really whatever they can get away with, right? Whatever they can manage to, you know, the least they can manage to pay people, that's what they, that's what they do. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a system built on exploitation. It's a system built on inequality, right? If you want more, if you want more money, you'll have to work harder, right? Or take on more responsibility. Um, and, and we're kind of, we're kind of used to this, right? Because I think most of us come from capitalist countries. Not all of us, but most of us do, right? Um, so that's communism. We'll come back to communism a little bit later because we'll, what we'll do here is we'll kind of follow the story of um, kind of the 1930s and 40s all the way through World War II, and then we'll kind of jump back and deal with the story of Russia, okay? So we'll come back to the communists a little bit later, but it's, it's important to know what they are. Um, and, you know, maybe that gives us a clue as to why people fear them, right? We said that um, Woodrow, uh, not Woodrow Wilson, David Lloyd George at the Treaty of Versailles, he was worried that if they were too harsh on Germany, Germany might turn to communism, right? They might overthrow all of their factory owners and create a communist state. Right? And, and David Lloyd George was kind of worried about that because that's what happened in, in Russia. Now, fascism is a little bit, um, a little bit different. And we're going to read a, a couple pages in the text that are going to help us with this. But fascism is really sometimes hard to define, okay? Because it's not easily for something so much as it's against a lot of things, okay? So fascism is really, in some ways, more about what it is opposed to rather than what it is in favor of, right? And democracy is very easy to define, right? Power, power to the people, or people have the power, and the rule of law, right? That's the two things that define a democracy, right? Communism, it's a state where people are treated as equal and the government attempts to give everybody what they need, right? It's fairly easy to define. Fascism is kind of slippery. It's hard to figure out what it is. Um, wh again, one of the reasons is that it opposes a lot of things. It's against a lot of things. The other thing is, is that fascists tend to kind of make up the rules as they go, okay? So the communists are trying to stick to the communist ideology and they try to stick to it as close as they can, usually. 
Democracies try to stick to their principles, right? Equality, you know, voting, people having the power, the rule of law. Fascists kind of make things up as they go, right? They don't have a clear ideology. Uh, they don't have a clear set of rules that they follow. They kind of do things and then they justify them later, okay? And so as you can see here, they're against a lot of things, right? They don't like liberalism, right? They don't like freedoms so much. Um, they don't like pluralism. They don't like societies with lots of different people in them. Um, they're not into individualism and individual rights. They're not into equality, egalitarianism. They're not into cosmopolitanism. They're not into sort of decadence and fun and culture and, you know, things like that. Um, they definitely don't like democracy, but they don't like monarchies either or oligarchies. They're kind of opposed to a ton of things, right? And as we'll see very shortly, fascism comes about because of a failure of democracy, okay? And again, if this is starting to sound a little bit like what's happening in the United States, then, you know, you can just let it, let it feel like that if you want it to. Um, but th that's kind of where fascism comes from. And so in this period of the 1930s in Europe, particularly in Germany, but also in Italy and a few other places, kind of what's happening is that these newly created democratic governments aren't working very well. Okay. And one of the reasons they don't work very well is that these democracies are new. People don't really know they don't really get how they work yet because people have no experience with democracy. But the other thing is that there are lots of small parties, okay? So if you imagine, oh gosh, how could we say this? If we're gonna vote on something and we want, and, and we need 50% of people to vote on something, it's going to be much easier to pass something if you have a smaller number of parties, right? If you have only two or three political parties, often you can get at least a 50% vote to pass something. But if you have 12 different parties, they're all kind of tiny and they're all kind of doing their own thing. And so, I, I, maybe I'm not explaining this very well, but what often happens when you have too many parties is that the vote is split too many ways and nothing gets passed. And so that's kind of what's happening here in these European countries. There's a lot of little parties to start out with. Everybody's doing their own thing and nothing is getting done because every vote that comes up fails, right? Oh, what about this? Fails, right? Everyone's trying to get their own way, but there's so many little players in the game that nothing ever gets passed, right? And that's kind of the strength of modern political parties. They tend to be big, right? And they all tend to vote the same way, right? So when Justin Trudeau proposes something to the House of Commons in Ottawa, he's talked to all of the people in his party before, right? He's gone around, actually he has it, the party whip has gone around and said, okay, we're all voting yes to this, right? Anna, yes, Avitaj, yes, Mir, they check, right? So when Justin Trudeau proposes something, the party all votes the same, right? So that it gets them closer to that 50%. But with a bunch of small parties, it doesn't work, right? And things don't get passed, right? Nothing seems to be getting done. Meanwhile, of course, they're in an economic depression, right? It's the 1930s. And so people are struggling, unemployment is high, they're still trying to recover from World War I. And what's going on with their new democratic government? <sighs> nothing, right? Those guys argue all day and nothing happens, right? What a waste. What is this democracy thing anyway, right? So people become kind of dissatisfied with what's happening in a democratic system. They don't want to go back to a king, right? And they definitely don't want a communist revolution either. So like, what are we gonna do, right? We don't want a king, we don't, want a, we don't want a communist revolution, and this democracy thing is not happening, 
right? What, what are we going to do, right? And so out of that kind of feeling, it happens a bit in Germany, but it happens in Italy and other places as well, is that fascist parties start to appear, okay? And usually it's led by a single charismatic leader, okay? And the idea here is that this leader has a vision for the future, right? He sees what's happening and he knows that, you know, we can be, we can be great again, okay? I know you're gonna laugh, but it's true. This is, the, this is a common story that fascist leaders will tell the people, right? Once we were great, we were a great people, but then something happened, right? Maybe we lost our way, maybe we were stabbed in the back by someone, maybe we were taken advantage of, right? And we were, we were screwed over, right? Something bad happened to us, but we can be great again and I will show you the way, okay? That is, that is the fascist story. And Mussolini will use it, Hitler will use it, other people who may, you may be thinking of may use it as well. But this is kind of the idea, right? And so the fascist is kind of looking back at a proud, glorious history but is also looking forward at some, to some sort of bright future, right? And that's kind of attractive to, <clears throat> sorry, that's kind of attractive to people who are stuck in the present, right? And things aren't happening. Unemployment is high. There's no money, right? They're still trying to rebuild from the war. Their democratic government is, you know, a bunch of clowns who can't decide on anything. Right? And who comes, who comes forward but this tough, brave man who says, we can do this. I'm going to take us into the future. We will reclaim our former glory and we will be great again. Right? And again, it's persuasive. It's exciting. Right? And it's a new direction because people who are in this situation look around and they don't see any good options. Right? They don't want a king. They don't want to be communist. Democracy, pfft, what a sham, right? They don't really have any options. And then this guy comes forward and says, I have the vision, right? I can take our country to the future. And that's, that's what the fascist does, right? Looks forward based on a, you know, a proud history and says that he will make the people great again, right? And so yeah, you can see that the fascists here are way out on the right, right? Not, they're not communists, they're not Democrats, they're not kings, right? They have a firm grasp on tradition, right? The tradition of their people. They're going to play a small role in the economic system, but they're gonna be very interested in the social life of people, in law and order, in making sure that people are doing the right thing and being the right thing. They're going to try and create a new man, a new society. Um, who's seen the first Captain America movie? First Captain America? Yeah, the Red Skull one. You've seen it? Hail Hydra. Red Skull and Hydra are perfect fascists, right? Because what's, what's Red Skull trying to do? He's basically trying to create a new, a new world order, right? He's using technology to do it. And he doesn't really care who or what he has to hurt or destroy to do it, right? You're going to have to, some people are going to have to die to create this new existence, right? And so obviously, you know, Hydra is kind of, patterned after the Nazis, right? And Red Skull is kind of a, you know, he's kind of a Nazi scientist kind of thing, right? That's kind of the, the character he is. But Hydra are hardcore fascists, right? They're excellent. They're an excellent example of fascists. And so that brings us to our first fascist here, uh, which is Benito Mussolini, 
And so he kind of predates um, Adolf Hitler a little bit. Hitler is probably, if not the world's most famous fascist, then he's probably in the top three, right? But Mussolini comes along a little bit earlier. Um, he's a different kind of character. Um, and I'll have you read a little bit of his backstory. Um, as you can see here, he he has a little bit of an interesting career. He's a journalist for a while. He's writing articles. Um, interestingly, he starts out on the left wing. So he's writing for a left wing newspaper. And then he switches and starts writing right wing stuff, interestingly. Um, he creates his own political party, creates his own movement, finds his way into the prime minister's office, and basically becomes a dictator, a fascist dictator in Italy. Okay. Um, now, to talk about fascism a little bit, I would just like you to read this short section of the textbook. So just the purple stuff, it's a page and a bit. Just a page and a bit. And just, I want to talk about the first three, the first three questions, OK? And this article will give us, I think, a clearer idea of what fascism actually is. Because again, it's a little difficult to understand sometimes, OK? So let's read, then we'll talk.
just a couple more minutes, okay? Two more minutes. Okay, so just a short section of the text here, but it does do a pretty interesting, not interesting, but a good job of talking about these bullet points of what fascism is about, right? And again, you can see here that fascist states have, is a nation where the, the, the nation holds priority over the individual. What does that mean? State holds priority over the individual. And just like regular, regular English. What does that mean? Uh, who, who is? Yeah, the, the state is more important, right? It's more important than the individual, which in some ways kind of makes some sort of sense, right? The state is huge, right? And the individual is just one person, right? But they're kind of going a little bit further than that, aren't they? Um, yeah, they believe that the state is greater than its individual parts. And they also feel that, where is it, where is it, where is it? Yeah, the government aspires to total control of the individual within the state. So each individual person is kind of not that important, right? And so, you know, here in Canada, for instance, I have our Charter of Rights and Freedoms says that I have a bunch of rights, right? There are things that the government can do to me and the gut things that the government cannot do to me, right? And it's part of our constitution, right? I'm, I'm guaranteed those rights. Those rights cannot be taken away from me. Right? except in very certain circumstances. But here in a fascist situation, that's not the case, right? In a democracy, the rule of law was on top, right? Nobody was above the law. In a fascist state, the fascists are actually above the law, right? The law becomes whatever the fascists say. And if tomorrow I don't have any rights anymore, then that's the way it is, right? Because the fascists have decided that that's what's best for the state, right? So whatever kind of rights or freedoms I might be guaranteed in a democracy, in a fascist state, I'm given the rights and freedoms that the fascists think I should get today. And if tomorrow that doesn't make sense anymore, whoosh, those are gone, right? And so again, people's individual rights, individual freedoms, don't much matter, right? It's really the good of the state. And people, people are kind of used to, you know, for the good of the state, right? Um, I'm gonna go to number one here. Who did the fascists see as responsible for Italy's social and economic collapse in the 1920s? The d democracies and Democrats? Yeah, and I guess the second part of that question is, is, is in fact number two. Why did they see, why did they blame democracy, these fascists? 
Why was democracy at fault? Why was why was democracy being blamed? Okay, what does that mean to you in regular regular English? What does it mean when we say that um, the um, the problems were caused by the government turned over to the rule of the ignorant masses? What does that mean? What are they talking about? In a democracy, who has the power? In a democracy. Everyone does. The people do, right? Yeah, the people have the power in a democracy. But the fascists are saying, yeah, but what if the people are all idiots? Right? You're, you're turning over the power to make decisions to the country. But what if those people aren't qualified to make those decisions? What if they don't know what they're doing or what they're talking about? Of course, you're going to have chaos and collapse because you're giving power to people who don't know anything. They don't know how to run a country, right? You need, to, you need to give power to the people who know how to use it, or at least that's what the fascists are saying. Right? So yeah, they blame, they blame democracy for this. Right? Um, yeah, they blame democracy, right? Because again, can you trust the people? Right? Can you trust that the people know enough to make good decisions? Right? And you know, democracies usually believe that people can, right? Authoritarians and fascists, they think that, no, they can't, right? Only certain people can make those decisions. Um, the other thing that's interesting here about this idea about the individual and the state is that, again, the individual rights and freedoms, they're subject to state control, right? And so you get whatever the state says you're going to get, right? You do you serve the state or does the state serve you? You serve the state, right? And again, that's kind of the opposite of democracy, right? Often you'll hear, um, I think President Obama, when he left office, when he was done his term as president, he probably said something to the effect of, you know, it has been the greatest honor of my life to serve the United States in the office of president, right? So in that situation, Obama was the servant of the state, even the president, right? Even the president of the United States said, it's my honor to have served the, the people of the United States of America, right? And that's often the kind of thing that gets said, right? Is that the president is a servant of the people, right? He serves the people. But here, that's not the situation at all, right? People are the servants of the state, right? The state is greater than the people, but also the individual will, you know, have rights and freedoms, you know, as the state deems it, right? And again, there's, a, there's another difference here in terms of, I'm explaining this poorly, I'm sorry, that the dictator or the fascist party is above the law, right? And so the law becomes whatever the, Whatever the, the, whatever the leadership wants it to be, right? Whereas democracies are a little bit different. I kind of bungled that last bit, but that's okay. We'll fix that tomorrow. So we're just about out of time. Uh, we are basically out of time. Come back tomorrow. Did I say we were going to have a quiz on Wednesday or Thursday? Or, or anything? Thursday. Did I say anything? Did I say Thursday? I thought I put something in Microsoft Teams, but maybe I didn't. We'll talk about that tomorrow for sure, OK? Let me just see what I did. I could make a point about the fact that maybe I would have said it if anyone was here on Friday, but I won't say that. Oh, no, I didn't say anything about it at all, did I? Yeah. I didn't even post it. OK, cancel that. Maybe we'll have a quiz on Friday, but I'll talk about it tomorrow, OK? Because that's, I thought I put something in Microsoft Teams, but clearly I didn't. So, geez, I'm all over the place now, right? I'm all frazzled. Okay, that's all for today. Pack it up. Have a nice afternoon. I will see you tomorrow.
um, for more fascism, as if we needed more, but 